Hi, my name is uh, Luisa, Luisa Bastos. I currently work at Europe for Animals, um, an animal um, advocacy umbrella NGO that represents more than 80 pan-European organizations. Um, I am the program leader for animals used in science there, meaning that I am responsible for the organization's policies in, uh, in this area. Um, as part of that job, I'm also a board member of the European Consensus Platform for Alternatives to the Use of Animals and of the Center for Alternatives to, to Animal Testing. And I've also been very honored to, to coordinate a working group of, uh, of members of the European Parliament that are interested in uh, accelerating a transition to science without uh, animal experiments. Well, when I moved from academia to an NGO, um, I brought together two of my main passions, uh, science and advocacy. So at my current job, I, I don't build mathematical models anymore, but I continue modeling in a way. Uh, I build advocacy and, and policy strategies with the help of my colleagues and put them in practice. So today my job is to look at the scientific, political, and societal landscapes in the EU, identify opportunities, and define strategies that can help to transition to scientific practices that do not use animals. What inspired me to follow this career was part of the modeling work I did during the development of a high fidelity a medical simulator my team and I co-invented. So the simulator we built, as others I had worked with before, aims to, to simulate acute medical events that can, if not managed well, either kill a patient or leave lifelong squeals um, in less than 10 minutes. So one uh, event I modeled at the time was fetal asphyxia. And as you can imagine, it is not that easy to step into a labor ward or into the scientific literature and find the data necessary to model such a rare and life-threatening event. So I turned to studies of fetal asphyxia published in the literature, but for species other than humans, where of course experiments are, are allowed. And I went through half of a century of research and many species, uh, mice, pigs, sheep, non-human primates. And at the end, I had no bridge I could use to translate the results of those studies to model an asphyxia event in a human fetus. And so I ended up using all the clinical data I could, uh, I could find at the time to be able to, to build this model. And that shook me to my core because I found uh, a profound dissonance between our justifications for conducting studies on animals and the very low societal impact that those studies seem to have in fact. And I think it's important to say at this time that besides being a researcher, I was also an animal advocate already and was already uh, trying to influence laws and policies on other uh, uses of, of animals. So these experiences together um, inspired me to, to, do, to look deeper into the policies and, and beliefs that support the scientific culture that we have in life sciences. I've been doing this job for four years and I haven't had a, a typical year, let alone a typical day. Um, and not even confinement changed that much. So um, that's also one of the things I love about, about this job. But I can tell you more about the kind of activities that I do. And I work with, uh, with different teams. Uh, for example, um, I work, of course, with, uh, with my colleagues at Eurogroup for Animals. Um, I work with our political and communication teams. 
um, to set out and carry out our strategies for animals in science. Uh, we may need to seek meetings with politicians or with policymakers or with other stakeholders or organize a public event or campaign or just ensure media coverage on a certain topic. Um, but besides working with the, with the staff of the organization, I also work with a network of, of other organizations that are members of Eurogroup for Animals. And we try together to align our EU and national level strategies. And then I also work with, um, with the groups and people that are outside of the Eurogroup for Animals network. I have uh, a seat on boards and expert groups where academia, industry, governments, NGOs discuss their, their agendas to better protect animals used in science. And so all of us together, we seek for consensus within the EU to advance a transition to uh, a science without the use of animals and a culture of care for the millions of animals that are still kept in, in laboratories. My career path is far from, from linear and, and very honestly, um, this was not what I envisaged to be doing 10 years before I came to, to Brussels. So this to say that in, in my case, um, as I continue growing as a person, I feel lucky enough to, to always have found a way to who I am or who I become in what I do, in a way. So when it comes um, the time to, um, to choose a path in a, in a person's life, I think it's always too, too early. Um, and I honestly had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. But I had something that I thought at the time differentiated me um, from, um, dare I say, all my colleagues and, uh, and friends at the time, because I loved math. And, and not only I loved math, but I was very eager to understand how mathematics could help society. And so I chose applied mathematics to find that out. And um, I have to say, it was not always a fun trip because I had uh, a couple of years of, uh, that were, were quite boring, also with boring teachers. Uh, but things started to get interesting after the third year. Uh, I started to learn and apply mathematical skills to help to solve uh, problems in healthcare and, uh, and in biology. And it came, when it came the time to find uh, an internship, I knew I wanted to be a researcher, but um, not, not to any kind of research. I didn't want to uh, build robots that play football or serve drinks, as cool as that really sound at the time too. Uh, I wanted to contribute to saving lives. So long story short, that was how I, I ended up choosing the research path that led me to my PhD in biomedical engineering and being part of, a, of this very cool team that built um, a life-saving birthing simulator. But as I mentioned before, it was not only my studies and professional life that influenced my career. It was also my political activism. Um, it, was, it was crucial to, to my last career choice, the engagement I had with civil society movements and with political work, and in general, in, uh, in just caring about the world, the people and, and the other animals around me. So um, I think those were really the main, the main influences. But on top of that, I also had um, other bits that, that also helped me to fit within this position because I also um, uh, did uh, workshops and courses, for example, on leadership, practical philosophy, critical thinking, and animal ethics, 
and um, and all of that played the role in where I am today. Well, I've thought about that a million times and I think I have a million answers to that to that question. Uh, but I don't think that none of them is uh, is good because I could have followed um, many other uh, things that I'm curious about, psychology or biology or political sciences or sociology. Uh, and I'm sure I would have loved it and uh, and would be doing something else today. Um, because, well, only the history that I have uh, could really have brought me here to the work that I'm doing today. So if I have uh, studied something else, uh, I could even be uh, in the same organization. Who knows? It's possible. But I wouldn't be doing the same job and I wouldn't have the same perspectives. So only only who you are or who we are and with all the baggage that we that we carry behind us makes sense when we get here to the present i would say when i was still an undergraduate student um, there was definitely a teacher that inspired me um, it was um he was the one that I later chose to supervise my PhD. And he inspired me because he dared to be different. He was different. He was far from your typical academic teacher. He, he came from industry. He worked still with, the, with industry uh, and with clinicians, with his multidisciplinary uh, teams, international environments, and it didn't give a damn about the academic performance indicators that are usually expected from, uh, from, from scientists. He wanted to make a difference, and so did I. And so that was very inspiring for me at the time. And later on during my PhD, um, I already mentioned I, I am, entered the world of, uh, of practical philosophy. Uh, because in the city I lived, in Porto, in Portugal, there is a philosopher that organized philosophical coffees. And I don't know how common those are around the world, but as far as I know, those were the first in, in Portugal. And I think that those philosophical cafes, they they opened some new doors in my life that drove me to also follow some workshops on animal ethics, which, uh, which I would say without a doubt were milestones in my, in my way here. I'm the only one with, uh, with such a profile in the, in the organization and even colleagues that I worked with, uh, that I studied with um, in the past have, have quite different careers. Um, but in, in the team I work with today, we do have a philosopher, for example. So it's, uh, it's quite a diversified team, which is absolutely fantastic to work with such a a different uh, group of individuals and we're always learning so much from each other also because of that. When one is trying to, to change a system, um, thinking critically about not only the current system, but also about the consequences of the potential system changes, is, uh, is crucial to, uh, to be able to strategize. So as part of that, um, I also still do some research uh, more in the area of the impact of, uh, of science. Uh, now communication, communication is, uh, is something that I think is important in all jobs in some way, but it really became a major skill to master in this uh, in this job because I, I do need to truly listen to others um, to be able to establish wide collaborations between stakeholders and also present the network's views in a, in a compelling way. 
um, and then in, in leading also the, the program in the organization, I need to develop and negotiate strategies uh, in a way I need to manage expectations from colleagues, from members, and sometimes my own, I have to confess, and uh, also guarantee that the objectives of the program are, are achieved. And I also work in, a, in an environment that it's, it's, very, it's very volatile. Um, a lot of things happen uh, uh, every week, if not every day in this environment. And so that also requires um, a lot of um, the capacity of adaptability, uh, creativity, initiative, flexibility, and, um, and also time management is, uh, is very important here. Um, and because it's also an environment or a work that it has a very high social nature, um, it also requires a lot of social skills like uh, um, emotional intelligence, which is always growing, and a big, big, big team spirit, I would say. Well, some of my colleagues, um, uh, the ones that I studied with, uh, are still in academia. Uh, some still linked in some way to health technology, others to robotics, mathematics, or programming. Uh, others have uh, followed to work in the private sector, including on medical devices, insurances, finances. Uh, but biomedical engineering is really a, a very rich field. And um, I think that every institution, organization, or company uh, linked to health or healthcare or biology, they, they do have positions that can, can fit with the profile of a biomedical engineer. As a scientist, I think that the most wonderful challenge that I faced when I started this job was understanding the functioning of the EU institutions and um, almost from a blank slate design a 10-year strategy to achieve the goals of the Organization for Animals in Science. Now, I would say that a continuous challenge in this job is living in a, in a bubble of too much without losing focus. Um, it's easy to, to just pick up on each event that happens and simply be reactive. But we do have limited resources and hard choices have to be made um, constantly. So I feel that I am constantly deciding on what I will prioritize and what will have to be dropped for, 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 for lack or limited resources that we all have. I would say try it out and don't stress too much with the choices that you make or, uh, or need to make. I know uh, that they feel hard at times, they did for me, um, but try to, to follow your gut um, and know that the choice that you are making is not who you'll be. It, uh, it's, it's just a step that you are taking, hopefully leading to lots of fun um, that will allow you to, to know yourself a bit more and make other choices as you move forward in life. Life sciences have probably never been so important as today. We are facing challenges, um, many of them that we have created ourselves, and we are looking for solutions everywhere, even in places where it's not obvious we should be looking. So we need this area to, to broaden 
and to question itself, to go beyond the technology and open up to the thoughts of values and models of society that we want to achieve. Um, which is very much like in all that uh, touches climate change today. It's more that the, than the, um, the more hard sciences, it's a wider problem. So we need visionaries, we need more professionals that can help Europe and the world decide on a new strategy for science because this science is still serving poorly the environment uh, as, as humans and, uh, and other animals as well.